So glad you joined me today. We're going to be looking at one of the great prayers of the Bible. And you know, some of the greatest prayers in Scripture are the shortest prayers in Scripture. We're going to look at one that had a profound impact on somebody who's prone to make mistakes. I think you're going to enjoy it. We've been looking at great prayers of the Bible, actually studying the prayers themselves on Wednesday night. This is our eighth installment. And we're going to look at Jehoshaphat's prayer for deliverance. He was one of the kings of Judah. He was a good king. And uh, I'm going to share with you 10 thoughts from the prayer and some of the events surrounding it, some of the things that happened. And hopefully one, maybe two of these things will be good for you. You can latch on to them and, and get something from God that you need tonight. So we pick it up in... Second Chronicles chapter 20, Second uh, Chronicles 20, verse 1. It happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some, and ca some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord, and from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Now Jehoshaphat and Judah are threatened by the combined armies of several nations. Naturally speaking, things are looking extremely bleak for them. And here's some thoughts. Thought number one, Jehoshaphat went to God first. He went to God first. Bad news came, fear struck. It said Jehoshaphat feared, and the first place he looked was to God. Even as the psalmist said in Psalm 56, 3, whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. He didn't call on the king of Israel to join forces between Israel and Judah and fight the enemy. He didn't try and hire mercenaries from some of the surrounding nations as often happened in some of these scenarios as they unfolded in the scriptural record. But he went to God first. It wasn't a final last ditch attempt after all human resources had failed. It was God first. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. Everybody say first. Seek first the kingdom of God, and we need to seek first the God of the kingdom, not second or third or fourth. And it's not that God will refuse to help us unless we go to him first. That's not the case. It's just that we fail to honor him when he's relegated to the status of some hope-so backup plan after I try everything else. So first thought is God first. Whatever you're facing... God first. In your marriage, seek God first. The job situation, seek God first. You got a, a, a teenager that's acting like they don't have a brain. God first. And we all have been there. So it's, it's amazing how some parents get amnesia. But God first. Bad doctor's report. God first. Not after we exhaust every avenue of human help and then, oh, well, my, I guess I'm going to have to go to God, but God first. And then second thought is he set himself to seek the Lord. It's very interesting, and, and it, it reads slightly different in different translations, but that's a good translation. He set himself. He set himself to seek God. The Lord and set has several shades of meaning in the Hebrew language. It's really an interesting word. One meaning is to focus your total attention. So when he set himself to seek the Lord, he focused his total attention. There's a second meaning, it's actually a technical meaning. It means to hand something over to another or to transmit something to another. And it's used in both of those ways throughout Scripture. So to focus your total attention and to hand something over to another. Put together, 
Jehoshaphat focused all of his attention on putting his problem into God's hands. And we want to do that, hopefully, before we are finished tonight. Take our problems, take the things that are worrying us and robbing us of the quality of life that God wants us to have, put our focus on Him and put those things in His hands, which means they leave our hands. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all of your care upon Him, for He cares for you. So Jehoshaphat said, he set himself to do it. He was determined. And I just want to say to you, make up your mind that tonight you will release your problems to God. Not your responsibilities, but your worries. We're going to give them to God, all right? Thought number three, he proclaimed a fast. Now, fasting does not change God, and it doesn't convince him to do something that he's otherwise not disposed to do. And some people think, all right, I, I prayed, and God didn't answer, so I'm going to fast, and God will see me suffering, and, and this will somehow change his mind. Fasting does not change God at all. It doesn't change his mind. It doesn't make him more disposed to, to give you favor and grace than he would otherwise do. What fasting does is it helps change us. We're the ones that need changing, not God. It helps us to get into a position to hear from God and into a position to receive from God. And in fact, it literally quiets down the body and its desires if you fast long enough. And it is a way of humbling ourselves before God. And it is part of the Christian life. Every Christian should fast from time to time. Jesus said in his teaching, and when you fast... Wash your face, you know, put on your clothes and so that you don't appear to men to fast. He didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. He said you fast to your father who sees in the secret place and your father will reward you openly. So it is part of our Christian life. And frankly, when you get serious enough about getting an answer from God that you'll begin fasting, generally the answers you seek are not too far off. All right, fourth thought. Jehoshaphat enlisted others to pray with him. He proclaimed this fast, and everybody gathered together in Jerusalem to pray. Ecclesiastes 4 and 12 says a threefold cord is not quickly broken. If you have one strand, maybe you can snap it. You wind two strands together, it's tougher. You wind three, and it's not quickly broken at all. And the idea is there's strength, because sometimes when you're down, the other person's going to be up. They're going to lift you up. They're going to encourage you when you're, you're faltering, and, and vice versa. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 19, if any two of you agree on earth, Concerning anything you ask, it'll be done for you by my Father, which is in heaven. Don't do this thing solo, friend. You need to get friends and enlist the help and the prayers of others. And so we move on and we actually begin to get into the prayer as Jehoshaphat is praying in verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God, of our fathers. Are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? Now, as he prays, he actually acknowledges three things, and they're pretty important things. Number one, he acknowledges relationship. Number two, he acknowledges rule. Number three, he acknowledges the record. Relationship, rule, and the record. He starts out by saying, God of our fathers. That's covenant talk. And he even brings up our father Abraham. God entered into a covenant with Abraham, an agreement with Abraham. And an animal's blood was spilled, and that covenant was ratified by the, the shedding of blood. In fact, the Hebrew word for covenant that we read here is bereth. It means to cut where blood flows. And when they would enter into covenant, one party would say, all right, all I have I make available to you, and I assume all of your, your debts and your liabilities, and I yield all of my strength to you. And the other person says the same thing, all right? You know, I, all of my strength, everything I have, I make it available to you. And I also assume your debts and liabilities. You get in trouble, I'm going to go to bat for you. If I get in trouble, you come to bat for me. Now, obviously God was on the losing end of that, that covenant. 
on his part, you know, he has no liabilities. He has all of the resources. And on Abraham's side, it's just the opposite. And actually, the New Testament word sort of brings out God's position even better. It's a, it's a word, Greek word, diatheke. That's the New Testament word for covenant means the agreement that we have through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But the Greek word literally means an unequal covenant, where one party does all of the giving and the other party does, gets to do all the receiving. Can you guess it, which end we're on? All right, so it's covenant talk. He acknowledges this covenant first, relationship. Well, we have a better covenant established upon better promises. Jehoshaphat, Abraham, they were servants we are sons and we are daughters. It's a different relationship. It's a better relationship. I was in the house studying today, and I heard somebody rummaging around in one of the rooms. I came in there, Harrison, our oldest son, had come over, and he was looking for something. He didn't even knock. <laughs> Just came in the house and started taking stuff. He acted like he belonged or something. He does. And it wasn't like, what the heck are you doing here? It's like, hi, son, what's up, man? His family. I'm his father. We have a relationship. I have a relationship with God. He's my heavenly father because of the shed blood of Jesus. And I realize I'm on the receiving end of this. But what I can give, Lord, here I am. You know, here's my time. Here's my mind. Here's my voice. You know, here's my body. If you can do anything with it, you've got it, baby. But I realize I'm on the positive end of it. But I do have a relationship. So he acknowledges that in prayer. And when you start praying, you need to remember you have a relationship with God. You're not some outsider trying to convince some unwilling you know, person that you have some you know, uh, legal claim. It's relationship. And then he acknowledges rule. He said, you rule over the nations and no one can withstand you. How many think God still rules over the nations? How many think the kingdoms of the world are just a drop in the bucket to him? He can still wake up kings and queens in the middle of the night and have them do his bidding. I mean, who was it that woke up the king in the middle of the night and, you know, he had this crazy idea, bring me the police record. I can't sleep and I feel like reading the police records. And so the servants run down to the local courthouse and they bring back the police records and uh, the, the Persian king starts reading and says, hey, there's this Jew named Mordecai, and uh, he, fa he foiled an assassination attempt on my life. What's been done for him? He said, well, nothing. He's never been rewarded. He says, well, go get Haman and, and, and put Mordecai on his horse and have him you know, wear royal clothes and, and have Haman lead him through the city and, and pronounce, thus does the king do you know, for the man that, 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 that he favors. Well, it just happened that Haman was planning to kill Mordecai, and he'd already made a gallows to hang Mordecai on it. But God woke the king up in the middle of the night and gave him the idea to get the police records and read them. He acknowledges the record, talks about what God has done for them in the past. Again, in verse 7, um, he says, you gave this land, you know, to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. You drove out the inhabitants. He starts talking about things that God had done for them in the past. And I think it can be very valuable to take a little time and think about what God's done for you. You know, the psalmist, and I quote to you in Psalm 77, he said, I meditate within my heart and my spirit makes diligent search. What's this internal search all about? Here's the questions he asks. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased? Has his promise failed? I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. Has God ever done anything for you or for someone you know? Has he? All right, you're facing challenges now? It would do you good to acknowledge some of the past victories that God has wrought in your life. I dare say there's not a person in here that God hasn't helped in one way or another. I mean, the fact that you're alive and you're breathing says something. There's some, some wild boys and wild girls in here. It's a miracle you live long enough to get saved. 
I look, it's nothing short of miraculous that I live long enough to come to Christ the way that I was living. God has done things for us, and we need to bring those things to remembrance. All right, let's, let's read on, verse 8. Verse 8. It's talking about the children of Israel. It says, and they dwell in it, talk, speaking of the promised land, and built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. That is, you'll hear and deliver. You will hear and rescue us. All right, the sixth thing he does is he quotes a promise. And that's what he's doing here in verse 9. This is actually something that King Solomon had prayed at the dedication of the temple. God, if your people get in trouble any time in the future, if, if, if they're attacked by their enemies, if there's sword, if there's famine, if, if, if th bad things happen, God, if they'll turn toward this temple, it's symbolic of turning toward you, and they'll pray here and save them. And God sent down fire symbolizing and showing them that what Solomon was praying was indeed God's word. It was indeed a promise from God. And so Jehoshaphat takes the promise and he quotes it. That's so important. He said, God, you said that if we were in trouble or there was sword, hey, there's a lot of swords out there. I can see them. We've got alien armies surrounding us. That if we turn to you and we pray, you'd hear and you'd save us. God, you said it. It's your word. It's your promise. Now, sometimes help is adequate, but it's always better to have a promise. Help only works so many times when you have the opportunity to become familiar with the promises. Just think, your promise is like a garden hose. You can go to Home Depot, buy yourself a nice, bright green garden hose. You get a 50-foot garden hose, and you got that thing rolled up and said, this is awesome. I have a garden hose, and I've got a big garden, and I've got all sorts of stuff planted, and I want it to grow. Why won't any water come out of the garden hose? Well, that's what a lot of people are doing in prayer. You see, you have to hook the hose up to the spigot or to the faucet, which is attached to a series of pipes that are attached to the water main, to the source, to the reservoir. And you see, that hose is like your prayer, but you've got to attach it to the pipeline, which is the promise, that's attached to the source, which is God and His nature. <laughs> Jehoshaphat had a promise. And with those promises, you can water the garden of your marriage, the garden of your finances, the garden of whatever you need to grow. All right, verse 10. It says, and now, and he's still praying, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession which you've given us to inherit. So God, you wouldn't let us throw them out, and now they're trying to throw us out of the inheritance you gave us. All right, here's, here's thought number seven. It is not God's will for the enemy to take away anything God has given you. It is not God's will for the enemy to take away anything God has given you. Be confident in that. I think sometimes, you know, the, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus tells us. And the devil starts ripping people off, and they immediately go, oh, God must be mad at me. You know, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Well, Job did say that, and he said that in a right heart, but you ought to read the rest of the book of Job. God said, the thing Job has said is not right. Job couldn't pull back, you know, the curtain. He couldn't read Job chapter 1 and find out that Satan had smote him with boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. He couldn't find out who his real enemy was. The devil is the one that steals. And, but some people, it's just like, well, maybe God's taken this away from me. It's not God's will to take anything away from you that he's given you. And Jehoshaphat was smart enough to know that. God, they're trying to, to, to push us out of the inheritance that you gave us. Listen, 
It's not God's will that the enemy take away your family, your finances, your health, your peace, your liberty, nothing that God has given you. Jesus said to hold fast what you have. All right, number eight. Thought number eight, verse 12. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? God, take care of this. For we have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. All right, thought number eight is this. They confess their inability to cope with the situation. We don't have the ability, God, we don't have the resources, and we don't have the wisdom. And our eyes are on the enemy's shields and their glittering swords. No. And our eyes are on our own inability. No, our eyes are upon you. But they very, very, and Jehoshaphat very freely confess, God, we don't have the power to deal with this, nor do we know what to do. We don't have the wisdom. We don't have the resource to cope with this. We are bankrupt as far as being able to take care of this ourselves. Listen, that's not a bad place to be because zero plus God is all you need. And then it's not just admitting it and wallowing and, oh, I can't do this and I don't have that and I'm just so inadequate. It's not that. It's like Jehoshaphat said, God, we don't have the ability, we don't have the wisdom, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes aren't on our inability. Our eyes are not on our lack of wisdom, but our eyes are on you. We know we can't, but we know you can. And friend, that's the key. So he acknowledged freely, confessed his inability to cope, but then looked to God, and obviously God did um, answer him, just like God answered the Apostle Paul. You know, he says, I'm going to rejoice in these things, and the power of Christ may rest on me, and God's power doesn't rest on you to do nothing. When it rests on you, it delivers you, it lifts you, it sets you free, etc. All right, verse 13. I'm almost done. It says, now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, and their children stood before the Lord. All right, this is thought number nine. What are they doing in verse 13? I think people do everything we've read up to verse 12, but they don't do verse 13. They were waiting on God. The prayer's been prayed. These acknowledgments of, you know, God's past help of their relationship, all of those things, the promises have been quoted. They've made their requests known to God. They've confessed that they can't do it themselves. They said, God, we're looking to you. The prayer has been prayed. And it says they all stood before the Lord. They're waiting on God. See, friend, you can skip the meals, quote the word, come to grips with your inabilities, even enlist others to pray with you, but there are times when you must wait on God. Amen. Just tap your neighbor and say, wait. You wait for direction from the Holy Spirit. You wait for Him to impart what you need. An army would never dare move forward to engage the enemy without waiting for orders and without waiting for supplies. And the Holy Spirit furnishes both as we wait on Him. He furnishes orders and He furnishes supplies. George Mueller, and I would suggest you get George Mueller's diary and read it. Some of it's a bit dry, but it's, it's well worth the read. He made this statement. He said the most important time in prayer is the 15 minutes after you say amen. You know, as kids, we used to ring the neighbor's doorbells and then run away. <laughs> a lot of people do that in prayer. They ring God's doorbell and then they run off before the wisdom comes. They get busy with stuff and they never hear what God has to say. They run off before the direction comes. They, they, they run off before the resource and the supply comes into their spirit that the Holy Spirit wants to bring to them. I think most of... Our failures in life, most failures in ministry can be attributed to one thing. We've waited too little on God. We're too busy to wait. Our schedules are too full to wait. We're too nervous to wait. I mean, my goodness, if you sit quiet, if we sat quiet for five minutes in here, it would be so uncomfortable for some people. It's like, something's got to happen. 
No, they waited on the Lord. And they wait, and you know what? God speaks. Verse 14, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, the Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. So they waited on God, and the Lord spoke. He gave them direction. He imparted courage to them. He even supernaturally told them where the enemy could be found. And then there's just one final thought, and that's obedience. They wouldn't need to fight, the Lord said, but they would still need to obey. They still needed to go down where God told them to go down. They still needed to position themselves and obey God. You need to obey what God tells you to do. I hope that you got something out of that message today. And my prayer is that you will do something with it. It's been said that the only Word of God that we truly know is the Word of God that we do, that we practice. May you not just be a hearer, but a doer of the Word, and you will be blessed in your doing. We'll see you next time. God bless. God, are you there? Can you even hear me? I've been praying and praying with no answer at all. God, why won't you answer my prayers? Am I praying wrong? Why? You know, the Bible is filled with the stories of ordinary people like you and like me that prayed extraordinary prayers. They prayed great prayers that God answers, prayers that brought healing, prayers that brought deliverance, prayers that brought guidance. And I've done this series on great prayers of the Bible. We actually look at the prayers themselves and we discover some secrets and some truths that can help us pray great prayers in the circumstances and the situations of our life. I know it will be a blessing to you. Great prayers of the Bible. Bayless Conley shares prayers that get results in his message series, Great Prayers of the Bible. Request your CD or DVD copy today when you call the number on your screen or visit AnswersBC.org. God is there. He can hear you, and He wants to answer your prayers. Request your copy of Great Prayers of the Bible today.